Good morning, folks. Hope you've had a nice couple of days. Let's see here. What's this one? Yeah. Anybody out there yet? Good morning, Caitlin, Tiffany, and Jerkita, and Brandy, and Millette. Good. I hope the audio is coming through well. Hi, Haley. Hmm, okay. Thank you, Jerkita. Glad you're in touch with her. Let's see here. Millet. Okay, where are you, Millet? Okay, there you are. And Hannah, good morning. Good morning, Alexis. Mm, thank you for asking, Jerkita. She is still uh, in pain, and nobody knows what's going on but the Lord. Doctors can help sometimes, but we sure don't know it all. Uh, uh, Victoria, Jalen, glad you're here. Let's see who else is over here. Okay, ten. Tiffany's here. Did I see Tiffany's name? Yep, Tiffany's here. Okay, good. And Caitlin. Caitlin is here. Brandy. Alexis. Yep. Thank you. Appreciate that, Jerkita. It's pretty tough on her. Okay. Okay, Cody. Okay, Nicholas. Give them a couple of more minutes and then we'll get started. Let's see, we finished chapter 11. And I sent you a study guide. Is that correct? Trakita, did you get one? Did you get a study guide in your email? Down there at that bottom left corner. Great, great. Okay. So we're squared away with that. Hello, Andrea. Okay. 
Okay. The audio is coming through well, isn't it? No problem. Riley, okay. Glad you're here, Riley. Give a couple more minutes. See if Joyce is coming in. Let's see. Did I see Haley? Yep, there you are. Okay. No Amanda Roush yet. She may come in a little late. Sometimes it takes a while to get on the system. Joyce, good morning. We were just talking about you. Didn't say anything bad. Just... Know sometimes it takes a little while to get on the scene. Okay. Okay, missing Nobby and missing Amanda and Rhonda. She might be coming in a little late trying to get on. Asada, Monica. Maybe she's having a tough time too. Jessica McKay, Greeley. Okay. Any questions about the uh, quiz next Thursday on Chapter 10 and Chapter 11 before we get into Chapter 15? I don't think we've gotten into 15 yet, have we? Can we get started in 15 a little bit? Oh, good. Monica's here. Okay. All right. Okay, so Tiffany, you're saying that we have not started Chapter 15 on the eye and the ear, have we? That's the last uh, couple of structures that we want to look at. They call them special senses. Uh, sometimes um, they're still part of the nervous system. Okay, good. All right. So let's look on page 546. This, this stuff is just amazing to me. When you start taking the eye apart, and the ear just is, a, is fascinating how it's just beautiful. All these little components and they start from one little cell. That's the way it was with you and me started with one little cell 
And when we get into all the different parts of the eye and how it functions so well. Thank you, Tiffany. Um, that's why I'm in this business. I'm just blown away with the body that we live in for so many years. It's just, it's fascinating. The engineering is, is overwhelming. So as you look on page 546, they're going to talk about some of the accessory structures of the eye. So as you look on 546, you see the lids. You know, we take these for granted because we, can we say we grew up with them? <laughs> and we never gave it much thought uh, about, about them, but they're all part of a functioning body. And so you see it talks about the eyelids. And if you come down to the second line over to the right, you see it says they prevent foreign objects from entering the eye. That's very true. Of course, stuff can fly through the, the soft tissue of our eyelids, but for the most part, you know, bees will bounce off of it or whatever. If um, and, and little rocks, sometimes, although it can bruise the eyelid, it, it doesn't necessarily penetrate the eyelid or pierce it. So it's there for protection. And you notice it also says it distributes tears across the surface of the eye. So there's a, a couple of functions of the lid. Now, I want you to look for just a moment on 547. We'll come back to 546 in just a moment. But look at the figure nine, figure, figure 15, nine. Joyce, I know you got a little different book. and there's, I think Jalen's got a little different book. Um, figure 15, nine, we're on 547. We're looking at a picture that's called the lacrimal apparatus. So, Joyce, if you have a different page, if you just print that out so... Um, Jalen and somebody else, whoever's got a different book, uh, can uh, be on that page. Thank you. I'm on 547. What page are you on there, uh, Joyce? Oh, oh wow, Joyce. Oh, I tell you, you got your hands on hope on the steering wheel and your mind on the road. Okay, thank you, Lindre. 545. Okay, just be careful, Joyce. Hope everything turned well for uh, for you down in Charleston. Hope it's going to be a pretty drive. We always like to go down 52. It's not as crowded. It's hardly even traveled, you know, and so it's just a nice drive to come back on 52 as opposed to having to drive 70, 75 miles an hour uh, with all these people around you. But anyway, be careful. So as you look at this picture, and Jalen, uh, Lindrea says it's on – 545, I think you have a book similar to their edition. So you look at the eye and you look to the upper left of that eye. That would be the right eye that they're taking the picture of because you see the nose is in the middle. So you look this way and it's their, their right eye. And you see the lacrimal gland. And so that gland is producing what we call tears. There's some little ducks that we've got eight or 10 little ducks up here with that gland. And um, it's always producing tears. Now, we're not crying in the sense of joy or, or sorrow or pain or whatever, uh, but we're always producing tears. Now, <clears throat> one of the things that we think of when we have the, the, the eyelids, uh, we think they shut like this, straight up and down. Let's pretend that this is the right eye over here. So whenever, if we could look at it very slowly, it doesn't close like this. When we blink, it looks like it does, but it does like this. And so it pushes the tears 
from what we call the, the lateral, um, uh, what do they call that thing? I've forgotten the name of it right now. Um, there's a particular name they use for it, uh, commissure, uh, but there's another name too. And I can't remember it right off the top of my head. Canthus, canthus, that's it, canthus. So it, it right here is that the lateral canthus here, right there, and then this little place where they come together over here, they call that the medial canthus. Now they got another name for it too, but you can just know canthus. And so the eyelid closes like that. Therefore, it pushes the tears across the surface of the eye, and it's picking up bacteria that we run into during the day. It picks up fungal spores, little tiny specks of dust, maybe some viruses or something like that. Somebody's hacking and coughing around you. And it pushes it medially towards your nose. And look at the structures medially close to where the nose is. You see up at the top, start going down the middle of the, all those little areas that are written. You see the lacrimal punctum. Lacrimal, of course, tells you it's a tear. And then punctum is a point. All of us had to learn how to do punctuation, didn't we? Punctuation like periods or colons or semicolons. There's tiny little marks like that, the little... Uh, apostrophe when we um, make something possessive, you know, like the dog's dish in D-O-G apostrophe S. So um, there are tiny little openings and notice there's a tube that comes from those openings. They're called the lateral, uh, excuse me, the lacrimal, you can just call them lacrimal canals, uh, canaliculi, that's Latin but you can say lacrimal canals. They collect your tears. They're, they've been doing it all night long. They're doing it right now as you watch the, the lecture. And then you see those lacrimal canals empty into what they call the lacrimal sac. Can you imagine that forming in you 18, 20, 25 years, 73 years ago for me? Fascinating stuff, how those cells know to do that. And so the tears go into the lacrimal sac, and then they come down to where it narrows into a duct that empties into our nasal passage. So whatever was on our eye gets flushed. It's what we in microbiology call a flushing mechanism. If you stop a flushing mechanism or you you don't necessarily have to stop it, but if you just impede it, I-M-P-E-D-E, -E, that means to sort of slow things down, you can have some problems. One of the things that happens when guys, and sometimes girls, uh, guys get gonorrhea and they think, well, okay, I can get a shot and then I'll go out and have some more fun and go back and get another shot. And they get infections in there and it can cause a little scar tissue and it influences the urine coming out the bladder. Hi, Nobby. Oh, you were waiting for them. Oh, boy, they let you down, didn't they? <laughs> so that can create a problem in your bladder. Well, the same thing can happen here. If there's some sort of damage to the lacrimal uh, duct system, then things can get clogged up and you can have a backup of fluid that's got spores and bacteria and so forth. You end up with a problem. You can end up with an infection. So you want to take care of that. Let me write down... Nobby's here. Where are you? There you go. Okay. Thank you, Nobby. So that's just a system that helps to flush uh, things off of our eyes so that we don't have a buildup of, of critters there. So that's the, the tear gland. You can call it the tear gland. You can call it the lacrimal gland. So, so we're through with that. 
Now, you look back on page 546, and Jalen, I'm not sure where that is, maybe 547 or something. We're looking at the second column where it says eyebrows and eyelashes. And you see they serve a protective mechanism. The eyebrows, um, you see re the sec second line says the, the brows um, prevent perspiration from running into your eyes. That's true to some degree. You probably have sweated enough at some time if you were working hard in the yard or, you know, summer job or uh, you were uh, an athlete and you still sweated and, Sometimes it's so much sweat comes off our forehead, still gets down toward our eyes, but the, the eyebrows and the eyelashes help to reduce that. You also see it on the next page that the eyebrows reduce the glare in bright light. There's a bright light over my head. It's really kind of nice when um, I wear a cap in here sometimes. You've seen that. And it gives a little shade and it gives, I can see a little better. It's not as bright and light diffusing as, it's just better to see that, see more detail. But anyway, that's um, that's their functions. And you see they're still on page 547 in the first column, eyelashes are stiff hairs. And uh, they keep things, sometimes we squint our eyes when it's real dusty. And those eyelashes actually filter the air, if we can say it, that is moving around. And it keeps some of the larger particles off the surface of our eyes. Notice it says they're richly innervated by ending so that the slightest touch triggers a blink for protection. Have any of you ever had a sty? S-T-Y? Yeah, not much fun, is it, Monica? Not much fun at all. It's like a, a little boil, a tiny little boil. It's really a, it's a folliculitis type thing. And, uh, well, I'm glad you got away with it, Jalen. <laughs> They're not any fun to have. We usually get over them. I had two or three when I was a kid. Um, Jessica, glad you're here. Let's see. Okay. Thank you, Jessica. We usually get over them. Somebody will put a little bit of cream on there or whatever, and they usually go away. But they, they do kind of obstruct your vision just a little bit, depending on how large they can get. But I guess I've never had one since I was about 15. So uh, anyway, that's a sort of a folliculitis uh, along your eyelids. Now, still on page 547, we see the heading called the conjunctiva. Now, they some people say conjunctiva. Some people say, as you see over here, conjunctiva. Or some maybe evidently say taiva. I'd have to look it all up. But there's a lot of things. Um, there's a lot of words that people say in different, with different emphasis on the syllables. So you can call it the conjunctiva, you can call it conjunctiva, uh, taiva, but this is a, a sort of a membrane, it's a tissue. I want you to look on the previous page, figure 15-8. Figure 15-8. And you see that little girl, that girl's eye. Now look to the right and you see a cutaway view of an illustration of the orbit that's the socket. You probably have already covered that, uh, the uh, opening in our skull that our eye fits into. They call it the orbit. So if you would, look at the figure B, lateral view, view. And I want you to come down to the very bottom of that image. And I want you to look to the right. And at the very bottom, you see it says bulbar conjunct.
Tifa. I know she didn't enjoy that, Tiffany. That's not any fun to have them. You see bulbar, or they call it ocular conjunctiva. Now follow the line that shows you what it's talking about. Now see how it looks like a piece of paper lifted up or, the, or a towel or a sheet or something lifted up? See, all that is, it covers the anterior surface of your eye. But if you will follow where that line that's pointing out the bulbar conjunctiva, or you can just call it the conjunctiva conjunct, conjunctiva, don't worry about bulbar. But if uh, that's the membrane that covers the front of your eye, and follow to the left where that line uh, goes over the lifted up edge and go to your left and you see the conjunctiva or conjunctiva, tiva, whatever, lines the inside of your lower eyelid. The same thing is true for the upper eyelid. If you look up at the top now, about the same area where you see that sheet pulled up, that membrane pulled up, go straight up, and you see it's pulled up at the top. And you notice it goes right to the left and coats, covers, adheres to the inside of your eyelid. So the covering on our eye goes up and then goes toward the upper lid, goes down and comes to the back side of the lower lid. So you have protection on the surface of the eye. When I was a little kid, and I don't know where I got this idea, you know, kids come up with some, some crazy ideas, not based on fact or anything like that or observation, but uh, you, you've gotten an eyelash in your eye, and sometimes you've had to sit there and look in the mirror and try and take a Q-tip and just touch that lash and see if you can get it out because it's irritating. And I used to think, where do those things go when they're when it's not irritating anymore? And I used to think you had a little bucket hanging under your eye, and that's where your eyelashes fell when they fell. I don't know where I got that idea. Maybe you had a crazy idea too. <laughs> that's why that's why we, the way we think as kids. But anyway, you know about conjunctivitis. What's the common name for conjunctivitis? Asada, hey, great, glad you're here. We're on page 547. We're looking at the eye. That's correct, Monica. It's pink eye. It's right, Jerkita. Uh, no, fortunately, it's not glaucoma, Nobby. But, yeah, that's a guess. That's right. We're going to get to that in a little bit. But conjunctivitis is an irritation. Could be an infection. Could be a viral infection, could be a um, bacterial infection. If you get pus coming out of the where the lids meet, then you have a bacterial infection. Bacteria produce pus. Viruses don't do that. And of course, you can't take an antibiotic for a virus because antibiotics don't work on the anatomy of a virus. They work on the anatomy of a bacterium. Now we know about conjunctivitis, or as you commonly said, pink eye. It is one irritating thing. I am so glad I've never experienced that. But some people say it's like having sand in your eye. If you've ever gotten dust or sand in your eye, you know how irritating that is. And sometimes you take a glass of water, hold your lid open and pour it in there trying to flush it out. 
It's, it is so uncomfortable. You can't use that organ when it's that uncomfortable. Everybody okay with the conjunctiva or conjunctiva? Oh, did you, Jerky? Oh, well, you, you're probably the expert on how to describe the discomfort of those events. They're just awful. I'm glad I've never experienced that. Hope I don't, in the later days that I have on this earth, I hope I don't have that problem to show up. Life's tough enough without having your eyes irritated to, to the Dickens. All right, let's look still on page 547. You see the extrinsic eye muscles. Now, extrinsic, what would that suggest to you? Extrinsic eye muscles. Just off the top of your head. It's okay if you're wrong. Get it out of your system now. That's right. That's right, Monica. They would be the muscles on the outside of the eye. You've got some internal. I don't know why they call it extrinsic. They ought to call them external, too. You know, it's kind of a, you're right, Jalen. That's the outer layer. Um, it still means out outside. It's just somebody else's way to use it. So as you look into that paragraph of extrinsic eye muscles, you see in bold print in the middle of the page, you see superior, inferior, lateral, and medial. Well, that's pretty easy to picture on that eye, isn't it? Superior muscle would be up here. Inferior would be here. Lateral would be out here on the side of the eyeball. And then here would be the medial. It's hooked to the medial surface of the eye. That part's it's, uh, close to the midline. So here you go using those terms that you guys had to learn back in uh, the first few weeks um, in the lab. Now, we've also got a couple of oblique muscles. Uh, it's interesting how they are put together. But let's look over on page 548. This is figure 10, 1510. Figure 1510. This, you remember what the term rectus means? Anybody remember that? Straight. Good. Very good, Jaquita. It's straight. It's um, it's not some sort of a curve or anything like that. So you see superior rectus. You come over to the very right. You see on the lateral surface, they have a picture of a lateral view of the eye, and you see lateral rectus. And then you look into the middle and come down about three or four, and you see medial rectus. Those are all straight muscles that can turn the muscles to the left, excuse me, turn the eyeball to the left, turn it to the right, raise it, lower it. And you've probably seen some people, some of you when you were kids, you know, you you tried to play with your eyes in the sense that uh, some people would concentrate on being able to just roll their eye like that. And they could do both of them. I think they had to do them in sync. But uh, you know what kids do. They just do all kinds of crazy things. It's something fun to them to do. Not immoral or unethical, so it's no big deal, but that's what those muscles do. We also have a couple of other muscles. I'm not going to get you to know them. They're called the um, inferior oblique and the superior oblique. Uh, that's one that can make your eyes, so instead of going left or right or up or down, it can either pull it down at an angle or pull it up at an angle. How many of you can cross your eyes? I think some, some of us used to be told, don't you do that. They'll get stuck. You've been told that? <laughs> Kids again, they just do all kinds of crazy things. You know, they're experimenting with, with their body and what they can do with their body to have their 
um, school friends go, wow, look at that. I want to learn how to do that as if that's going to get them a good job or something like that. Yeah. We're, we're just crazy as young kids. Anyway, the purpose of those muscles and you have control of them. So what kind of muscle would that be since you have control over these eye muscles? What type of muscle would that be? Good. Voluntary. Mm -hmm. Maybe another turn. It's good, Monica. Mm hmm. That's right, Jalen. Yeah, Alexis, that's right. Voluntary. And then, of course, it's skeletal muscle, isn't it? Yeah. You have control over that muscle. And it is hooked to the skeleton. It's hooked out inside uh, the back. You can see there. So anyway, just getting you to think and apply what you've already learned. So now you know those muscles. You want to know those four. And so uh, you think about what it makes your eye do, superior makes it pull up and you can look up like that. Or you're looking down when somebody's caught you in your hand in the cookie jar. Mm, don't like that. So it helps you move the eyeball. Now, still on page 548, look at the bottom illustration. Kia, thank you for being here. We're on page 548. We're looking at the eye. So as you look at page 548, figure 1511, figure 1511. So now you want to come down, you've got, what kind of view is that? Ooh, I, I, I shouldn't ask you that. Well, I'm going to ask you that. Just look at the eye for a moment. What kind of view is that? What sort of plane is that? Remember those planes that you had to learn back in the first part of the semester? That's right, Monica. It's a sagittal view. So we've cut it this way. And so they're looking in from the, the side. So we got a lateral view. And let's look over to the left. And you see this bracket, and it mentions fibrous layer, vascular layer, neural layer. So we want to go through those. Those are components of your eye. And so you see, first of all, where it says fibrous layer, you see the word sclera, and you see how it points to what we would call the white of our eyes. One of the things, if you read some history, uh, you'll find that if the folks are at war with each other. Sometimes they were instructed not to shoot the enemy until you could see the white of their eyes. That would mean they were close enough to where you'd be very hard to miss. So anyway, that sclera is pretty tough. As you, uh, you look over on page 549, the facing page, You see it says the eyeball in the first column. Come on down to layers of the eyeball and you see fibrous layer. And you see the fibrous layer, the outermost layer of the eye has two parts, the sclera and the cornea. And we saw that in the diagram. But I want you to come down in that paragraph. The sclera, the white part of the eye, covers most of the, the eye structures. Come down to the corner of that core principle. 
at right hand corner and look to the right and you see it says the sclera's numerous collagen fibers. What do we know about collagen? Give me something that tells you about some term that tells you about collagen. Don't forget this stuff because you go this summer or this fall, this stuff's going to come right back on you. They go and say, well, you don't remember that? You did, did you take 210? Don't you tell them if you forgot it. Don't tell them you took me. Okay. Strong. Good. It, it's a strong fiber. That's right. It's a protein. Good. Monica, that's great. Chiquita, you're right. So as you see, it says numerous collagen fibers allow it to resist deformation, which is... Uh, some uh, damage to it from external and internal uh, forces. Notice it says these fibers are arranged irregularly, which is why the sclera is opaque. What does opaque mean? You ever heard that? If something is opaque, what does that mean? Good. Um, it doesn't really mean you're, it's white, Jerkita, but it means light can't get through it. If something is opaque, then light can't get through it. So you can't see through it. So those fibers are all irregular. You remember dense, irregular connected tissue, how the collagen fibers were all arranged in uh, diff different ways. It was not a uniform um, uh, parallel structure like that. So the sclera is pretty tough. Now, you know, there are people who get injections in their eye, very small needle, and they push it through and get inside the eye and they administer some sort of medication when people have certain degenerative conditions in the eye. Now, that sounds pretty horrible. Um, but from what I've heard, it's not too painful. I've known two people who had to get injections in the eye, and it slowed down the degenerative uh, um, situation in that person's eyeball. It doesn't get rid of it. It just slows it down. All right, so you got the sclera. Now, the sclera runs into the cornea. So as you look at the picture back on page 548, Again, we're looking at fibrous layer, and you see the word cornea, and you see it pointing to what a lot of people hang their contact lenses on. has a little bit of a bulge to it. So that's the cornea. Now, let's see here. It's, surely it's covered somewhere in this. It mentions cornea at the beginning of layers of the eyeball. Okay, look down in the second paragraph. It says the sclera is continuous with the cornea. And it says, unlike the sclera, the cornea is translucent. That's another word to say that light will pass through it. If something is translucent, trans, across, lucent, light, so light goes across the cornea. Now, come down from where you see that in that second paragraph under the fibrous layer. And you see it says um, the cornea, come down, come down, one, two, three, four lines. The cornea is translucent due to its orderly parallel arrangements of collagen fibers and lack of water, and blood vessels. Cornea doesn't have any blood vessels. But it does manage to repair itself if the damage is not too uh, severe. So it makes a difference how you arrange these collagen fibers, doesn't it?
Everybody okay with the sclera and the cornea? That's called the fibrous coat or the fibrous layer as your textbook uh, speaks of it. So let's move in. Now over here on the on page 549, the second column, you see this heading that says in bold print, vascular layer. If it's vascular, what does that mean? Got blood vessels, that's right. Has veins, uh-huh. Rich in blood vessels, very true. Now we've got several parts to this vascular layer. I want you to look on the diagram again, diagram 1511, and you come on down from where we looked at fibrous layer. We saw the sclera and we saw the cornea come down where you see vascular layer. And the line goes from the little word, little four-lettered word called the iris. Now, when you think of iris, sometimes that's a girl's name, isn't it? Iris is a flower. Iris is a real pretty flowers. Don't call it Irish, okay? Don't do that. Irish refers to people who are, are cultures and practices who uh, that occur in Ireland. So don't get that mixed up, all right? Very close to it, one letter off. So the iris is what we would think of as the color of our eye. Amazing little structure, just amazing little structure. Now I want you to come over. We're talking about the iris. So look on page 549 and look at the second column and come down to number three those bold print terms, and you see the iris or colored portion of the eye is the extension of the vascular layer, just anterior to the ciliary body. And that'll mean something in just a second. We know anterior means in front of, right? So some of you like to look in the irises of somebody that you care about. Maybe your boyfriend, maybe your girlfriend, maybe your husband, your wife. You think they have pretty, we say you have pretty eyes. Of course, a lot of, there's several things that go to make pretty eyes, you know. But some people like the color that's there. So we can have different color depending on uh, uh, how many melanocytes we have. And if we, and you can get green and, and uh, sort of gray eyes uh, without it. Little kids when they're born got little gray eyes, maybe sort of blue eyes. And then they change over time. But anyway, let's look at what it says about the iris. It's just anterior to the ciliary body. Now, come down to the next paragraph that starts off, the iris surrounds the pupil. Now, the pupil is an empty space. It's a hole in the iris. I wonder how they figured to name that thing pupil. Because a lot of times students are called pupils, aren't they? Because they're empty of knowledge. There's nothing there in the sense of what we want them to know. So it's just a space, an opening through which light enters the eye. The iris, as you see in the next sentence, contains two muscles that obviously they contract. And they protect the eye and improve vision by controlling how much light passes through the pupil. So it controls the amount of light that enters your eye. If somebody asks you, what's the purpose of the iris? Don't tell them it's to look beautiful. It might do that. That's not the function of it. The function is to regulate how much light enters your eye. It's 
So let's look at these two muscles for just a second. Notice the first one. Come down to one, two, three, four lines, and you see the bold print. It says the pupillary sphincter. <clears throat> Where's another place in your body where you have a sphincter? Kia, can you tell me where a sphincter is located? Kia, can you do that? We'll give Monica and Jerkita a little break here. Jalen, okay. Wait, so does contact lens sit on the iris or the cornea? Good question. Let's go back and look at the sagittal view of the eye, and then I hope, hope that'll uh, seal the question for you. As you look back on page 548, you see that bulge that we call the cornea. That is the tissue on which your contact sits. Because the iris is deep to the cornea. Remember how you had to learn superficial and deep? See all those great words you had to learn? They really have a place, don't they? That's, that's your language now. So the contact lenses hug the cornea. Okay, got it? Good. <clears throat> okay, now let's see. Who was I calling on? Let me think. Oh, Kia, have you figured out where you have another sphincter in your body? Kia, Kia, come on. What's at the end of your GI tract? What is that structure that is the end of your GI tract? Joyce. Oh, that's right. You Joyce, you're you're driving. I just want you to listen and watch the road. Not necessarily in that priority. Lindrea. What's the end of your GI tract called? Mm, Joyce, Joyce, are you are you texting or anything? You know, you can get in trouble a lot of ways that way. I don't want you to do that. <clears throat> you that's not at the end of your system. The anus is the end of our system, and that's got a sphincter around it. But you do have what they call a pyloric sphincter. That's the one that is at the end of your stomach. That's right, Jalen. It's called the anal sphincter. That's right. So we've got a number of sphincters. We're not going to get into all of them now. You'll pick up some more when you take up 211. But you see, in your eye, you have a sphincter associated with your iris. That's a circular, got to get back so you can see my hand, a circular muscle. And we've got, got a number of those. But anyway, notice what it does contracts following parasympathetic stimulation and constricts or reduces the opening of the pupil. You see it reduces the amount of light that comes in the eye. Look at the normal pupil in the middle down at the illustration, or not the, yeah, I guess it is somewhat of an illustration. Look at figure 15, 12, and in the middle, that's what's sort of normal. But if you get in really bright light, what happens is the pupillary sphincter closes down, squeezes down, and makes the pupil very small. It's a protective mechanism. Too much light can damage 
the photoreceptors that we'll talk about a little bit later. Oh, good. I appreciate your uh, thoughtfulness and your safety there. Where else did, was one? Yeah, did you think of one? Did you think of one, Joyce? That's fine. Yeah, what you said was fine. No problem. Just get you. I'll have to get you. You'll learn how to spell it when you get into the GI tract. Now, if you walk out on a dark night or even a nice night, you know, where you have a little bit of moonlight or something like that, then what's going to happen is the opposite. Look at the next bold print term and you see pupillar, pupillary dilator. When that muscle contracts, it opens the iris. And lets more light in. All of us sometimes have to get up in the night and go to the bathroom. And so when we get out of that bed and start walking toward the bathroom, unless there's some kind of bright light in there, or even if there's a little tiny night light, that's all you need is a little bit, then your iris opens, the pupillary dilator opens, and more light comes into your eyes so you can see the shapes of your chest of drawers and the edge of your bed so you don't catch your toe on something and break it or whatever. Now let's let's think for just a second about this. We've got a pupillary dilator, we've got a pupillary sphincter. Do you consciously control those muscles? No, you don't, do you? So what's the type of muscle that composes the iris? You only got three choices. See, I'm getting, trying to get you to apply what you know. Yeah, you could call it smooth muscle. You can call it visceral. That's right. Just trying to get you to make these connections. See, we have to give the information in groups. But uh, you want to start applying it. And then, oh, okay, that's where some of that is, because we typically think of it in just our uh, digestive system, don't we? That's where most of the time people go in terms of thinking about visceral muscle. Nothing wrong with that, but you've got other uh, muscles that are visceral, not under your conscious control. And it's good that they're not. They just automatically do it. You don't have to think about it. Pretty neat system, isn't it? Now, how many of you have, well, let's go back for just a second. Think about, we just came out of the nervous system. And imagine a cell body of a neuron. And imagine the axon coming down and attaching with the telodendria, see those terms are coming back. Those telodendria attach to the visceral muscle. You have a neuromuscular junction. And when light comes in and you need to, uh, or when light is not coming in, let's say talking about your pupillary dilator, then those telodendria release a neurotransmitter onto the sarcolemma of the visceral muscle and that little muscle contracts and opens up. See, there you hook into the nervous system and the neurotransmitter and the myoneural junction. Start thinking like this. Start thinking like that. You just, you have to start thinking that. That's going to be your life. You guys are going to be medical professionals. And so it's just like with me with microbiology. I'm watching even 
commercials on television and I see something that, oh, that's going to fit into microbiology. I take it and I apply it to microbiology and sometimes the kids go, oh, okay, now I understand that a lot better. I, see, I got something in real life that uh, I, I can picture and, and appreciate. That's good. I need those things too. Somebody else can describe the event a particular way and I go, oh, okay, I got it. I can relate to that, okay? That's what I'm trying to get you to do now because we're going to put it all together on a final exam, right? Start doing it, okay? Okay, now we're done with the iris. You know that it can close down. That's parasympathetic stimulation. And the uh, circular um, sphincter closes it down so you don't get burned in there. And then when you don't have enough light, you have the dilator muscle that opens up and the nerve that um, is hooked to it releases a neurotransmitter. We're not going to get into all the kinds of that. But have you ever been to the eye doctor and had your eyes dilated? Can y'all still hear me? Or has the sound gone dead? Oh, good, good, okay. Well, see what they might have given you is a neurotransmitter. Ah, okay, okay, Monica, Chiquita. but they might have given you a neurotransmitter that would stimulate the pupillary dilator muscles. And so they open up and then now they can look in there and they can see a whole lot of stuff. And, you know, within a few minutes, it's, um, it's gone, but they want you to be careful when you go out into the bright light, you might need to put on some sunglasses, give a little protection. Good. Okay. Nobby, that's good. Okay. So let's come to the neural area, uh, the neural layer. Looks like we're not going to get through this, um, this hope, as I was hoping to, but it's pretty neat stuff, isn't it? So on page 550, you come down in the left column and you see neural layer. We won't really call it that, but you'll know it is. It's made up of nerves. And you see it's called the retina. The retina. Don't call it the retina, okay? It's the retina. And as you look down in there, it's the innermost um, layer, the neural layer, and it's got photoreceptors. Man, those are fascinating. You get to look at them. And you, I mean, I do. I look at them. Still, I look at them, and I'm just fascinated at the shape and the function. Just beautiful. Okay, so we're talking about the retina. Now go to the top of the page, 550, and uh, Jalen or Joyce. Well, Joyce, don't worry about it. Jalen, uh, I'm on 550. You might be on 551 or 2 or 549 or something like that. If there's anybody else that's kind of lost is where that picture is. Uh, it's in those pages. You're looking for figure 1513. It says photo of the interior of the eye. It looks like a big kind of orange, whatever color you ladies want to call it. Y'all are better at that than I am. Was kind of orange to me. Maybe like grapefruit, pink grapefruit or something like that. I don't know. So there's some, there's some components there I want you to know. 548. Thank you, Jalen. So as you look in the second column, 
you see that um, you come come to the second paragraph and you see this bold print term says fovea centralis. They have an arrow drawn to it. That is the center, can we say the dead center of your retina? The dead center of your retina. It's not dead, but you know what we mean, right in the very middle. And it is filled with photoreceptors. If you look uh, into that paragraph, high density. Good afternoon, or good morning, Ramsey. Glad to see that. So we're on page 550, or depending on what book you got, Ramsey, it's 548 maybe. So we're looking at the fovea centralis, obviously central, okay? And you've got some photoreceptors there. They are really concentrated in that particular area, just very thick. Now, look at the next sentence after that. It allows for extremely detailed vision. When you look at an object, there's so many photoreceptors there that you pick up a lot of information from the light that is coming off of that object that you're viewing. And as you look, you can see various details. Gives you very sharp, <clears throat> sharp vision. Come down to the next bold print term. It says the fovea is located in the center of a yellowish region called the macula lutea. Now, lutea means yellow. Obviously, it doesn't look very yellow in the illustration, does it? And you see it says, which also contains a large number of photoreceptors. Now, they bring in the macula lutea because you may know some people who have a condition called macular degeneration. Macular, just put an R on the end of macula. Remember, you got a lot of photoreceptors there, but if you have macular degeneration, you're going blind. And there's nothing we can, we can't cure it. It's just a process of dying. Sometimes people have gotten shots through the sclera, a little fine needle goes in there and they put a medicine in there. It does not cure the situation, but it slows down the degeneration. I don't know how that works. I have not looked it up. Be interesting to find out what medication they give to somebody if they have macular degeneration, but it just slows the process down. Let's, let's see, we got what, about five more minutes. I want you to come down to the next paragraph, which speaks about the axons. You remember that an axon is the part of a neuron that carries a message, an electrochemical message away from the cell body. Um, the axons of the optic nerve gather at the optic disc. And you see that over to... In the case of the diagram, it's over to the left. And there are no receptors there. You probably have played with that in um, uh, maybe high school. Maybe if you took a little bit of biology in high school, they might have talked to you about that. Uh, but that's a place where you, you don't receive any information. There are no photoreceptors in that area. 
it's a small area, and we don't even realize that we're missing it. But you guys can play with this at the bottom of page 550, where you see it looks like a slide, a glass slide, and got a circle on one side and an X on the other, or you got a broken pencil on down at the bottom or an X on the other. You follow the instructions to the right. No, we're not going to do that now, but you follow the instructions to the right, and you'll find that you really do have a blind spot. Hadn't bothered you for, what, 15, 18, 20, 30, 40 years or something like that? So we don't worry about it, but it's just a physical structure. As you come down from the optic disc, the paragraph with the optic disc, disc, I want you to look at the, um, not the next paragraph, but the second paragraph. You see it says the two layers of the retina are in contact with each other. Certain conditions such as trauma, diabetes, or an abnormally shaped eye can pull the inner layer away from the pigmented epithelium, and you can have what's called a detached retina. So if you guys have diabetes or you're moving in that direction, it's good to alter your diet, follow the physician's orders, uh, get some exercise. I don't know that you can um, cure it. You see a lot of medications on the television. I think it's, I believe it's Trulicity is one of them. Uh, there's three or four of them on there that come on to talk about uh, how you can regulate your A1C, they call it. And so if you've got that, it would be good to watch your diet so that you can bring that sugar down or maybe take a medication, like we mentioned, Trulicity, that could um, bring it down to some degree. I don't think you ever really take care of the problem, but you hear people say, I can make insulin on my own with the help of a drug. So we don't understand the whole situation there. People used to just get insulin shots, but they're finding out more about it, but it's important to keep it in a particular range. Exercise helps that. Also eating the right kinds of foods that don't throw a lot of uh, glucose into your system. Um, you know, even candy bars and soft drinks and stuff that's basically just carbohydrate, just jacks that sugar up. So just keep that in mind. Okay, let's look at one more thing and then we're going to get out of here. On page 550, you see down at the bottom, you see lens. Now, most of you, when you think of lens, you think of a camera. Nothing wrong with that. And you've got a lens that you can focus. You can turn it, and it will um, bring things into clarity. You can find that in binoculars. You can find it in telescopes and so forth. So you see it says it's a flattened sphere. You can see a picture of it on page 551. Figure 1515. And you see where it is uh, it's posterior to the iris and pupil. Light comes through the pupil, goes through the lens, and then hits the retina. Now look at the last sentence on page 550. It says after that figure 1515, it is surrounded by the ciliary body. You look up there and find the ciliary body in that illustration up above and connected to the ciliary body by suspensory ligaments. Picture the sun and imagine the rays, if somebody draws those, the rays that are coming off the sun. Okay, picture that, and let's say you had clouds that were surrounding, had an opening so that the sun could be seen, 
you could say that the sun is the lens. The rays of light that go out are the sil uh, suspensory ligaments, and the clouds would be the ciliary body, which has a muscle in it. So when the ciliary body contracts, it pulls on the lens and changes its shape. Changing the shape causes the light to fall right on the retina. Right where everything will be in focus. So can you control the ciliary body? Do you consciously control the ciliary body? And the muscle that's in there? Well, the answer is, like you say, Jalen, nope, you don't do that. It does it automatically, doesn't it? It does it automatically. Now, we know we got problems. That's why I got these on. And some of you wear them. Sometimes the eyeball is a little long, sometimes a little short. Your autonomic nervous system takes care of that. That's very good, Jerkita. Independent. It's independent of your thoughts. So you don't have control over that muscle. That's another visceral muscle, the ciliary muscle that's in that ciliary body. Sometimes they just talk about the, the two things as if there were one. Okay, so now you know how we focus light onto the retina, which is the neural layer where we have a picture form and we'll stop here we'll do the cavities and chambers uh, come next tuesday okay and then we'll have your fourth test on thursday at 9 30. okay do you have a question All right, I'm going to end this thing. So have a nice weekend. Look forward to uh, talking to you. Be nice to see you. I don't know how long that's going to happen. I like face-to-face -face stuff. All right. Have a good weekend.